All right, next section we're going to talk about, I titled hydrostatics. Hydro, because we're going to be dealing with? Water. Yeah, not just water, but any fluid. So, and statics meaning still. So in this case, it's not the flow of water. We're not going to be dealing with water flow. That'll come later. So, but everything else involving fluids in this case, not just water. So first thing I'm going to do is just define density, and sometimes more specifically called mass density. We are not going to use the letter D in this case. We're going to use the Greek letter rho to represent density. So if you're taking a chemistry class, we'd probably use the letter D. So but in physics, we're going to use the, the letter rho here. And what is density, or more specifically, mass density? Good. Mass over volume. And if we use SI units, what would this come out with units of? Kilograms per meter cubed. Cool. Specifically, which compound's density are you supposed to remember? And pure water, and technically it's at 4 degrees Celsius, but whatever. It's the only temperature you're really going to talk about for the most part. And what is the density of water at 4 degrees Celsius? <laughs> 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. If you're taking an OCHEM class and you were dealing with the density of water, you'd probably more likely see it as 1 gram per milliliter or 1 gram per centimeter cubed. So, but for SI units, 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed, and I highly recommend use SI units wherever possible. Um, sweet. The reason this is so important is we often talk about what's called specific gravity. Often abbreviated like that, but specific gravity is just an object's density relative to water's density. So if I told you I had an object that was twice as dense as water, okay, so then how dense would it be? 2,000 kilograms per meter cubed. But we'd say its specific gravity was two because it's twice as dense as water. And so technically, the way they define that mathematically is it's the density so of that substance over the density of water. So just relative density of water. So notice, again, if, if I had that substance, would we say its density would be? It would have been 2,000 kilograms per meter cubed, like we said before. And water is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. And we can see that, yeah, that would correspond to a specific gravity of 2. So if something has a specific gravity greater than 1, it's more dense than water. If something has a specific gravity less than 1, then it's less dense than water. Cool, but it's just this kind of relative thing here. We use it quite commonly, so something you should definitely be familiar with. Notice, does it have units? No. Density over density, unitless. Question. So is specific gravity always going to be comparing it to water? It's always compared to water for specific gravity, every time. OK. So also got to talk about pressure. And we've already talked about this loosely when we talk about elasticity of solids. But again, what's the technical definition of pressure? Cool, force per area. So if we got tired of Albert over here, and I came and I tried to stab Albert in the head with a marker, am I likely to pierce his skull with a marker? No. So, but let's see, I got a little more inventive, and I found an ice pick. And I took that ice pick, and I tried to stab Albert in the head with an ice pick. Is that likely to pierce his skull? A little more likely anyways, as long as I hit him hard enough, right? So, but in this case, I hit you as hard as I can in either case, so I didn't apply any difference in force. But why is the ice pick more likely to pierce your skull? Yeah, it's got a much smaller surface area over which that force applied. Pressure is proportional to force, but it's inversely proportional to the area over which it's applied. A smaller area generates a much larger pressure, maybe enough to pierce Albert's skull. Sorry for the morbid example, Albert. So, but that's force over area. And in this case, what's the SI unit for force? Newton and area? Meter what? Meter squared. And so in this case, a newton per meter squared is a what again? Pascal. That's your pascal. And your pascal is the SI unit. So this is a little funky, because if you're taking a chemistry class, you'd probably use atmospheres much more commonly. So, and you're probably still going to see atmospheres on a regular basis. Notice, where does the, where's the unit atmospheres come from? Well, it's just the weight of the atmosphere at sea level which is atmospheric pressure. So that's where they get that unit. So it's really commonly used, but it's not SI, right? And so we got to know some conversions. So one atmosphere is equivalent to 101,325 Pascal. It's 
also equal to 760 tor, also equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. When we take a look at manometers and barometers, we'll see where that last one actually comes from. So, but if you're doing some calculations, which unit you're probably going to want to use? Pascals. So if they give you it in any other units, you might want to be doing some converting to pascals. Okay, so question number three on your handout there. Question number three says, the applied force is tripled and the area over which it is applied is cut in half. What is the effect on the pressure? So the applied force is tripled and the area over which it is applied is cut in half. What is the effect on the pressure? So let's look. So in this case, the force, we did what to it? We tripled it. And the area we cut in half. And you're exactly right. So in this case, we're kind of just doing some dimensional analysis here. Technically, what we really should be doing is that we're putting our new pressure, which I'll call P2, and it's equal to F2 over A2. Well, notice the fact that I put twos here really presumes the fact that we had a first set of conditions where there was a first pressure, first force, and first area. Well, in this case, how does my second force compare to the first force? Yeah, it's three times the first force. And so how does my area in the second case compare to the original area? It's half of that original area A1. And so if you look then, F1 over A1, that is the original pressure. Now we've got some new coefficients in front. And just like you said, 3 over 1 half would equal 6 times the original pressure P1. So 6 times greater. Simple plug in and chug in there. So let's talk about gauge pressure versus absolute pressure. And sometimes I like to refer to gauge pressure so as hydrostatic pressure, but more commonly called gauge pressure. So gauge pressure and absolute pressure. And why do you think they call gauge pressure a gauge pressure? You measure it with some sort of gauge. Sweet. So let's say I was going to air a bicycle tire, a bicycle tire. So well, let's not even go there. So let's say I had a gauge for measuring tire pressure. So and I put this gauge, and I'm just leave it sitting right here. So if I were actually able to push the little thing inside it so it was plugged in to the atmosphere in some weird way, what would it read? So would it read one? So, so it gets a little funky, but the, the idea is this. So we're more commonly going to talk about this as going underwater. Before I go underwater, your gauge is probably not going to read anything. Even though before you even go underwater, if you're at sea level, what's the pressure outside? It's still one atmosphere. The gauge is going to read everything additional past that as you go deeper and deeper underwater. Maybe that's the example we should stick with. And so they call that the gauge pressure. Does it give you the overall total pressure? No, it just gives you the water pressure as you're diving down below water. So let's look at this for a minute. <clears throat> so let's say we dive down below the surface of water, and we go down 10 meters. Obviously, as you go down, pressure increases. So we said this a little bit earlier, that that pressure increases depending on the density of the fluid, gravity, and the depth, h, to which you dive. The deeper you go, the greater the pressure. So and this is what the gauge might be reading as you go further and further down in the ocean, in a lake, whatever. So we'll take a deep, a freshwater lake. That way I don't have to figure out the density of salt water or provide that or anything. It's a freshwater lake. We'll assume the density is just the density of pure water. So in this case, what would this gauge pressure be then, according to this equation? Give me that in scientific notation. 
Out of the what? Cool. And what are the units on that? Cool. And that would be the gauge pressure. So, but notice, that's just due to the water. But already, due to the air above the water, weighing down. So, what is already the air pressure, if you will, at the surface? Well, one atmosphere, which would be how many Pascal? 101,325. And so if I look, my gauge at this depth is only reading this. But is that really the total pressure? No. It's just everything but the atmosphere. And that's usually what a gauge is going to give you, everything but the atmosphere. So if you want the, t the absolute pressure, which I'm going to call the total pressure in this case, you've got to add in atmospheric pressure, p naught in this case, plus whatever fluid you're diving down into. Now, why is it that as you dive down deeper into the water, the pressure goes up? There's more water. What do you mean there's more water? You're on the right track. More stuff pushing down above you. And so the deeper you go down in that fluid, there's more fluid weighing down on you that's above you. So same thing, as you go up in the atmosphere, what happens to pressure? It goes down. Why? Yeah, there's less atmosphere, less air above you weighing down on you. And so the pressure is really a measure of all the weight of all the fluid above you weighing down on you, whether that fluid is water or air, as the case may be, so on and so forth. So, but that's why your gauge pressure is related to the depth, how far down in the substance you are. Cool. So just your difference between gauge pressure and absolute pressure, be careful. So look very carefully. Are they asking you for the gauge pressure or the absolute pressure? Don't get the two confused. Remember, you've got to add in the atmosphere and something like this. So if in this previous example, I'd wanted the absolute pressure, what would the absolute pressure be? Assuming we're at beginning at sea level. Well, we'll start with atmospheric pressure, 101,325 Pascal, plus our gauge pressure of 9.8 times 10 to the fourth Pascal. And so what does our absolute pressure come out to? Say one more time. 